Writers League of Texas. This is Naomi Shihab Nye speaking from San Antonio. M. Michael, my husband, Miriam, my mother, Madison, my son. I just like M. Hmm. Well, Henry David Thoreau, because I think he wouldn't bug me too much. Would you call him a literary character? He made himself a literary character, so he really was. The days run away like wild horses over the hills. I think it was by William Gass. Like Brothers by Mark and Jay Duplass, the filmmakers. We've been a little addicted to all their movies, their independent kooky films, The Puffy Chair, Safety Not Guaranteed, Outside In, so many good movies. And so I ordered their first book written together, Like Brothers, just to read more about their perspectives and opinions. They're so funny and creative and understated and wacky. Also, you could watch their um, HBO series called Togetherness. It's a little wild. Probably a cat because a cat likes to be very habitual and loll around lying on its back and stare at things and seemingly not do anything for a long period of time, but I think its mind is really active. Believe in the words. You don't have to believe in yourself so much, but believe in words and their fascinating possibilities. A few getting together with another few, carrying you away to another few. Uh, believe in those words. And even if you don't like yourself on a given day or what you're thinking or your own fury at the situations in the world, um, sit down with some words and see where you go. Well, my fattest book of my childhood was called Favorite Poems Old and New by Helen Ferris, edited by Helen Ferris, who was the head of the Junior Library Guild, I believe. I still have my book, and if I'm not mistaken, it's been in print for something like 69 years. It's a crazy good book. I still love it. And I still find poems in it that I could swear I've never read before, which is sort of how I felt about it when I was in second grade. I think my mom gave it to me as a second grade, when I, as a birthday present. And I carried it everywhere. Its spine is broken. It's where I encountered people like Langston Hughes and Rabindranath Tagore for the first time. <laughs> It would be the unwritten story, the future story of Palestine and Israel, where all the people live as friends, brothers and sisters, helping each other, that story. You know there's at least one. Oh, I'm sure there are 50. Let me think a minute. I just taped the audio version of Everything Comes Next, and I think I became quite aware of some words showing up too much. 
But if you were to ask my editor, it might be shines or glitters or I don't know. I think she'd have too many. Well, William Stafford's writing the Australian Crawl views on the writer's vocation from Poets on Poetry series, University of Michigan Press. I have a very tattered copy, but I have loved it for decades. I've used it in many classes. People always say it was one of the most helpful books they ever experienced on writing, and I urge you to find it. Again, Writing the Australian Crawl, Views on the Writer's Vocation by William Stafford. There is also a wonderful book in the same series by William Stafford called You Must Revise Your Life. And there are so, and it's also great. There are so many terrific books in the Poets on Poetry series by Charles Simic, David Ignato, um, many other people. I urge you to get those books and you'll love them. They're so yummy. Okay. No, never, 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 never. Quick answer. One time someone sent me an Amazon review by a 13 year old girl that they said was so incredibly beautiful that I needed to go on there and read it. And I wrote them back, could you copy it and send me the text in another email and I'll read it. And they did, and it was very moving. So um, I appreciate the fact that they're on there, but no, I don't think there's any reason to read them. Baking, gardening, cleaning the bathroom. Yes, all those things, but they're not my favorite. My favorite would be trimming the vines. Uh, we have a lot of vines, old Queen's Crown vines. We live in a 116 year old house, downtown San Antonio, vines growing. So I always find it very, very peaceful to go trim them. Well, let's see. That book about the border, but I can't, I'm blanking on its title, although I read it, and I'm blanking on its author's name. But she got criticized heavily. This is not very good that I'm blanking on both things. American Dirt, was that it? American Soil? Um, I couldn't figure out why people were so mad that she wrote the book. Uh, I don't really think you have to be an old, old man to imagine the perspective of an old, old man. Um, when I was a kid, I used to think a lot about the perspectives of old men because I had a grandfather and I had a lot of old, old neighbors. And I remember thinking, is this okay that I would write what I see from his window, pretending that I'm him? And I think it is okay. Now, certainly that sort of cultural appropriation uh, for me to pretend, for example, that I would know what an immigrant trapped at the border in a cage feels like. Um, but I think if a human being used imagination, you might be able to imagine what that person would feel like, and it might be important for you to have empathy for that other position. So. I just felt like the reasons the author, please forgive me, author was being criticized were kind of outrageous because how could there have been any fiction books or Shakespeare or anybody imagining other perspectives ever? Why were people so angry at her? Jack Kerouac, my birthday twin. I would grab any book by William Stafford or W.S. Merwin. Mac.
Angela's Ashes. Virginia Duncan of Connecticut and editor-in-chief of Green Willow Books and publisher. And we've worked together for 30 years. And she's just the smartest person I know about writing. And um, I trust her implicitly. We've never had a fight that I can remember or even really a disagreement. Even when she wanted me to take the becoming a vegetarian chapter out of Habibi, and I wouldn't. And then so many kids wrote me later to tell me that was one of their favorite chapters. Um, and I felt so vindicated. Uh, it wasn't a disagreement. It was just, she likes meat. I don't like meat. I won't eat meat. Nobody. A question like that has no meaning to me. I never think in terms like that. Well, I would say to my whole life, anything by Tom Waits. But I don't play him when I'm actually writing. But I play him a lot of other times in my life and in my days. So he's always with me. I don't know. I really miss, during the pandemic, hotel rooms. I kind of loved anonymous hotel room desks. And I spent a lot of time in my life, because I traveled so much, writing at different desks. And I always felt connected somehow to the whole stream of people who'd ever sat at that desk, even if they were businessmen tallying up their food expenses. I just felt connected anonymously to humanity by sitting at anonymous desks. Um, I really love desks in Japan, very tiny desks in tiny rooms, um, desks in the Middle East with the call to prayer drifting in through the air. But those aren't strange spaces because people are supposed to write at desks. So I don't know what's the strangest space. I do like going outside to write, sitting on the steps, sometimes just with a notebook and a pencil, like I did as a child, sitting in a chair in the backyard. I just love that writing is an activity which requires so little equipment. It's so simple, beautiful. <laughs> I don't know, maybe return, maybe the space. I can't tell that. I don't know. Anything by William Stafford or W.S. Merwin. They are my constant daily go-to poets for sanity in a really crazy time. The Twig at the Pearl in San Antonio, Texas. I would like to be a full-time baker with our grandson, who's four, who's a very good baker, and he's excellent on pie crusts, and we bake a lot when we're together, and when I was 18 years old, I did have a dream of starting a bakery in Canada. So maybe we could still do that. Alive. You know, life is fragile. I feel very lucky for all the days I've had so far. I think living through the COVID pandemic has caused us to realize once again the preciousness, the delicacy, the fragility of human life. The strongest physically people in our family had COVID and were so sick for seven weeks. So uh, they survived, thank goodness, but alive. That 
awareness of aliveness has taken on a more intensified meaning. And I don't really think it's a factor of aging um, because I know I'm in an age where people start thinking a lot about their own mortality. But I've thought about it all my life, as most poets do. Uh, one of my best friends died when she was 45. And I've thought all these years that I've lived without her, um, this is not fair. She should be here. She should be living. Why do I get to be alive? And she doesn't. She was so much smarter than I was. She's still alive in my heart and so many hearts, but yeah, alive. And thank goodness for writing because writing helps us feel twice as alive while we are alive. And if we're readers, we're many multiple more times alive. Okay, thank you Writers League of Texas for making me think about some things and um, take care. I'm honored to be asked. You can find me in my new book, Everything Comes Next, Collected and New Poems, which is just out this very moment from Green Willow Books. It's meant for teenagers, but is hopefully for anybody. Mm -hmm.